Good morning. I love spending time at Marie's cozy beach cottage in the summer, when the days are long and the light particularly lovely. And just as Marie enjoyed tootling around Campbell River in her trusty Camino, I enjoy exploring this beautiful area on foot. Come and join me. This also gives us a chance to talk about the history of punctuation. As a poet, I'm fascinated by the fact that most writing around the world was first written without punctuation, and even without spaces between the words. The reason this fascinates me is because writing written in this way needs to be read out loud to be understood. In fact, until the 12th century in the West, reading almost always meant reading out loud. Doctors even prescribed reading as a form of physical exercise, since it involved not simply the eyes, but the mouth and the tongue and the throat and the lungs and the ears and indeed the entire body. And this fascinates me because the great key, the great secret to poetry, is to read it out loud and listen to the sounds of the words. For example, here are two lines from Robert Hayden's poem, Those Winter Sundays. Read them silently to yourself. Now join me in reading those two lines out loud. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black coal. Did you notice anything different reading those lines out loud? Perhaps, for instance, you noticed how the letter C in clothes was echoed by the letter C in cold, and also by the CK in blue-black. And perhaps you've also noticed the BL in blue was echoed by the BL in black, blue-black. And perhaps you've also noticed how the C sounds and the CK sound have in them a kind of coldness, put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. This is a coldness that will be dispelled later in the poem, when Robert Hayden's father makes banked fires blaze. All of which is simply to say that our enjoyment of language, and particularly of poetry, has as much to do with our ears as with our eyes. And so it makes a kind of sense that the earliest forms of punctuation in the West, in Greek, simply indicated how long to pause when reading words out loud. The person who thought of this idea was the playwright Aristophanes. He used a dot in the middle of the line to indicate a short pause, a dot at the bottom of the line to indicate a medium pause, and a dot at the top of the line to indicate a long pause. This practice, however, didn't catch on, and it wasn't until the Middle Ages when Christian monks turned their attention to copying the Psalms and the Gospels by hand that we start to see another use of punctuation. In illuminated manuscripts, decorative letters and paragraph marks start to grace the very beautiful pages. I've always been fascinated by these. Aren't they beautiful? Also, in the 7th century, a bishop named Isidore of Seville, who would later become a saint, revived some of Aristophanes' ideas 
and created what we now know as the period. He took one of the dots that for Aristophanes simply meant a pause of a certain length and made it into something more like a stop sign, a signal of the end of a sentence. Another one of those dots became the ancestor of the comma, helping to show the grammatical structure of a sentence. After this, spaces began appearing between words, and what we now know as lowercase letters first came into being. From this arose the practice of capitalizing the first word, as well as sometimes words within a sentence. People also began inventing new punctuation marks. And so, when Johannes Gutenberg began using his printing press to publish the Bible, these spaces between words, capital letters, and punctuation marks found their way literally into print. The rules of their usage, understandably enough, were the result of decisions made by different printers over the years. To this day, we can trace different styles or ways of using punctuation to particular presses, such as the University of Chicago Press, as well as to particular organizations, such as the Associated Press. But even if the rules may be somewhat different in different cases, the primary aim remains the same, clarity of meaning in written expression. So as you continue through Marie's course, I encourage you to keep in mind that punctuation helps to make clear to our eye the meaning of the sentences we read. And also that you can take pleasure and enjoyment in reading things out loud, especially if, like poems, they are meant to be read out loud. That way you can encompass the entire history of reading and punctuation in one seemingly simple little act. Now I'll let you join Marie in her trusty Camino for Lesson 1. She and I both look forward to exploring the specifics of punctuation with you. How to use periods, colons, semicolons, commas, quotation marks, question marks, exclamation marks, apostrophes, brackets, parentheses, dashes, hyphens, ellipsis marks, slashes, and all those other dots, lines, and squiggles on the page. In between your lessons with Marie, I'll take you on some additional explorations on foot. We're so glad to have you with us. <laughs>